much better. The call to worship is from Psalm 135, verses 1 through 7. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever, in the, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the sea and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from its storehouses. God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory that we can return to him. Amen? Amen. Let us keep that in focus as we come before him in our worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day you've blessed us with. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity it is for us to gather together as believers in Jesus Christ to worship the name of Jesus, who is the name above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We praise you, Lord, for the wonderful things you have in store for us today. We pray that you will bless us as we return thanks to you for all the blessings that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please rise for the opening hymn, number 328, Surely the Presence of the Lord, and we're going to sing it through twice. CD playing and then and Sandy Patty and Warner Air Harris were, were singing I just seen Jesus and I looked out and saw the, the weather outside and I said, you know it just don't get much better than this does it? and here I'm coming to church coming to church surely the presence of the Lord is in this place amen, amen. amen. thank you musicians we are so blessed with you too <laughs> We can clap. We can clap. We are blessed with those two. Oh, my goodness gracious life. What do you have to be thankful for today? Oh, life. Life itself. That's good. Well, look at you. How are you? Good to see you, dude. And what do you have to be thankful for? Thanks. Life and the fact that I am redeemed. It's wonderful. Amen. Amen. I, am Pass it. I am redeemed, too. Good for you. I'm going to skip you because I can see you trying to dodge me. <laughs> and 
you. Yeah. You know, I, I, I told Jim, or somebody this week, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but whatever, uh, I, I said something to him. I said, you know, when I come down, or when, when all of you see me coming down the aisle, all of a sudden, the water service gets bigger. Because you don't want to look me in the face. You've got to look, you look there. And if you're not looking at this, the song look. Oh, goodness, i got to read it. I sure love the world. Hello, Mark. How are you? What do you have to be thankful for today? Just that I'm here. Oh, you woke up this morning. Sandra? Jesus. Oh, my. Rosemary. God got me here today. Wonderful. You know, if you're happy to be here, and you are look forward to, to being with fellow Christian this morning, clap. Amen. Because you know what? And I say this so many times. Look around. It's not only we're gonna have church, you know, church together. These are the folks you're gonna be in heaven with. That's right. Isn't that great? Yeah. So man, tell I'm glad I'm gonna be with you. Me too. I'm going to bring Jeanette. How about you, Carol? That's, i got to tell you this. Fun, that, that just reminded me. I'm going to do it quick, Jim. I'm not going to take time. It, it, this happened years ago, and we lived kind of out in the country in Pine Forest area out there. And I, I, I was working and came home uh, for lunch. And I came in, and I, Jeanette, I'm home. I'm home. And they get an answer. And I went in the kitchen, and there were her clothes. It was, and, and she does not do this. She doesn't do this, I promise you. She does not do this. But in a pile, were, there was her clothes on the floor in the kitchen. Even her shoes. And I thought, oh, Lord, <laughs> it's happened and I didn't get chosen. <laughs> She's gone. And I went looking around, bless her heart, she was down in the swimming pool in the back of <laughs> I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life because I knew I was left. I was it. I was the only one left. But look around. Man, we're going to be in heaven together, and isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Father, we just thank you so much for all you do for us. It's just so good to be here. Oh, and, and I, 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 I was listening to the music this morning coming in. I've just seen Jesus. What a marvelous song and what a marvelous thing to, to have on our mind because we will see Jesus someday. And we thank you for that. We just look forward to today now. We look forward to this service. Bless it. Use it. Anything that's said and done, may it be for your honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Turn to 361, please. Rock of Ages, clap for me. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's hear that he lives together. 
Sing it loud. Number 370, all three verses. according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, 
So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. May God bless the reading of his word. And that is just a wonderful reminder of who we are in Christ. We are brothers and sisters, and we all have a calling placed on us. And it's my honor to invite my wife up. She's going to sing a song that speaks of the names of God. And I'm so glad that she is going to sing this. It's one of my favorite songs that she sings. So please sit down and enjoy what she has to share. Good morning. Good morning. The name of the song reminded me of a picture that was given to me when we were first married. And it has the names of God. And it's so beautiful, and I hung this someplace where I could see it when we did our devotionals in the morning to just remind me, and it was very precious to me when my kids were little, because I needed extra energy, I needed extra strength, I needed extra just encouragement to get through the day sometimes, and uh, it was so wonderful to be able to remember that our God is everything. He's our protector, our defender, our ever-present help in time of trouble and need, and um, around the cross on this picture, it says, Thou, uh, thou O oh Lord, hast not forsaken those who seek thee, Psalm 910, and those who know thy name will put their trust in thee. So um, that was so encouraging. And El Shaddai means the all sufficient one. Uh, and then also has the uh, all the other names of God Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, El Elyon. Jehovah Shama, Elohim, Jehovah Ra, Jehovah Rapha, and so on. And they all have different meanings of God being our provision, our protector, our um, healer, our strength. And um, so encouraging to me. And I just, uh, when I think of this song, this is what I think of, is uh, how good our Lord is to us. Through the years. 
are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. <laughs> Following after a good example does not have to be annoying, but at times it can certainly be difficult. Amen? Amen? Well, Paul, in the passage that we looked at last week, which was all about Jesus Christ, presented our Lord as a great example for us to pursue as we seek after being holy. We can read it, we can agree with it, but how do we practically live it out how do we practice it in everyday life how can any person ever hope to achieve a life of obedience like jesus it just seems maybe presumptuous for us even to try but the title of the message today is obedience leads to joy because if we will learn to obey the scriptures learn to obey what god calls us to do we will be filled with joy and it will come as a blessing of our obedience the problem's not really all that difficult. Paul's not asking us to pursue something that is impossible, but instead he's providing us with a divine pattern of, of humility, and he shows us the way in which we can receive the divine power that will allow us to accomplish what God has commanded from us. Philippians 2.13 said, It is God who works in you. It's not by any imitation, but it's by his incarnation. Galatians 2.20 tells us that Christ, who lives in me, is the one who gives me the power to fulfill God's calling on my life. If you want to have joy in your life, then you need to cultivate obedience in your daily walk with the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we come before you with humble hearts. We come before you seeking after your will and asking you to fill us with your spirit each and every moment of the day because we cannot survive without your presence. Lord, I pray that you will clear our hearts and minds of any distractions that we may have this morning, that we will be solely focused on you in our act of worship by being here. Lord, speak to us loudly and clearly. Convict us where we need conviction and encourage us where we have need for encouragement. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. You are my Lord, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Beginning in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2, we see, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So if you desire to to have joy, then you must first resolve to be obedient to God. You must resolve to be obedient to God. Verse 12 tells us the Lord Jesus Christ provided us with an incredible example of selfless humility and service, and his example can be followed. Paul did so, and he called on the believers in Philippi to do the same, and the Lord is also calling us through his word to follow after his example. Paul, in his opening comments here, refers to the close relationship that he had with the Philippians, and he refers to them by calling them, my beloved. He commended their past obedience, whether he was present or not, and he urged them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice he did not say work for your salvation. He said work out your own salvation, not work for it. Remember that Paul is writing to people who are already saints, who are already believers, which means they have trusted Christ and they have 
been set apart. They are holy because God is holy. And the verb here, work out, carries the meaning of work to full completion. To full completion, such as working out a problem in mathematics. We all remember that, right? <laughs> Boy, that common core math has really changed things. But in mathematics, when we have a problem, we work it out. We, we follow the formula and we work it out and we come to the answer and the conclusion of what that problem uh, calls us to, to bring forth. Well, in Paul's day, this verb also was used for working in a mine. Those that would mine for ore, they, they wanted to, them to get everything that was valuable in that mine out. That's what it means to work out. It was also used in agriculture, working in a field. So you would want to get the greatest harvest possible so you would work out in the field. And our lives are like a mine and a field. We have tremendous potential. And God desires for each and every one of us to fulfill that potential that he blesses us with. And the way that we do that is to be like Christ. Romans 8, 29 calls us to be conformed to the image of his son. We're not to be some cheap imitation, some knockoff of other people, especially those that we consider to be great Christians. We're only to follow what we see of Christ emulated in their lives. Paul said to the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, that's a bold statement. What was Paul saying there? He said, look, I'm living my life in obedience to Christ. I am following after his calling that he gave me on the road to Damascus. I am going where he leads me. I am staying where he calls me to stay. And I am sharing what he is calling me to share. And I am being obedient. Now, can any of us say that? Be imitators of me, Paul said. That's where we should strive to be because Jesus Christ sets that example. And Paul would say, hey, I'm doing what I'm called to do. But every great saint, just like you and just like me, we all have feet of clay. We're likely going to disappoint you in some way. We have some area that we will fail you, I can assure you. If you don't believe that, just stick around with people for a while. You'll find out. We will fail you. But that should not be our goal. Our goal is to, is to be imitators of Christ. Verse 13 says, The only way we can be an imitator of Christ is because God's Spirit indwells within us and is working in us. And the only way we can have the Spirit of God is to be saved. You remember the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus? He said, you must be born again. What does that mean? He says, you've got to be born of the water, which is the flesh, and you've got to be born of the Spirit. You have to have two births. If you were to be saved, Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. I came to save the world. That's why Jesus came. And the only way to have the spirit is to be saved. Salvation is received. How? By grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, <laughs> not a result of works so that no one can boast. This is the only way that anyone has ever been saved is by faith and by God's grace. Even those Old Testament saints were looking forward to the coming Messiah. We have the blessing of looking back to the Messiah who's already been here. That's Jesus Christ. Saving faith surrenders all of life to God and his purposes. And he produces us to be mature Christians. And when we allow God's hand to work in our lives, to mold us and to shape us, we will find God is accomplishing his great purposes in this world, and we get to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. We see this, tr this truth operating in the life of Jesus. He commanded the crippled man to stretch out his hand. What did he have to do in order to receive healing? He had to believe that what Jesus called him to do would bring about healing. He had faith in the command of Jesus. And the very command gave him the power to obey and be healed. He also commanded Peter to walk on the water. Lord, if you just tell me, I will do it. Peter had to exercise his faith. And he got to do something nobody else has ever done in the history of mankind. Walk on water. But what happened when he took his eyes off of Jesus? What happened when he started looking at all of his circumstances and he started looking at the rain coming down and feeling the wind and he saw the waves crashing at his feet? When he took his eyes off Jesus, he sunk. And what did Jesus say to him? Oh, Peter, you have little faith. We must have faith. And we must have faith in the right thing. And that faith is in Jesus Christ because God's promises will release God's power. The Holy Spirit wrote down the promises in God's word. And he gives us the faith. Increase my faith. 
to hold on to these promises. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So the principle that Paul is laying down for us is this. God must work in us before he can work through us. There must be a work in us by the renewing of our minds that we read in, in uh, Romans 12. And this principle is seen throughout the Bible in the lives of men like Moses and David, the apostles, and so many others. And God had a purpose for each one of those men to fulfill. And each man was unique in their own way and not an imitation of somebody else. For example, God took 40 years to work in the life of Moses. Moses had to go to a place and be in solitude, raising sheep for God to work in him so that he could work through him. And then in his second uh, 40 years that he lived, he was leading the Israelites. And as Moses tended those sheep, God was working in him. Too many Christians today, and, and even in history, obey because of external pressure, something from the outside, rather than obeying from the inside. If you are feeling forced to obey what God says because you don't want to be condemned for something, that's not a proper motive. The way we should be motivated to obedience is to do it because we love the Lord. He said, if you love me, what did he say? You will obey me. So when we obey God out of love, that brings us great joy because it's not being served by a taskmaster. It's not doing it because we're afraid of the punishment we will receive. We're doing it because we love him. It's amazing how just a little change in perspective can change our whole outlook on life. It's sad to see the way some ministries suffer or fall apart because of a change in leadership. Because so often when a godly leader moves to another place in ministry in particular in the context of which we are, uh, it, can, it can be difficult. But when the spirit is moving and the spirit is guiding and we are obeying that spirit because we are all united in the spirit, we're not divided. We've been blessed. We are moving forward in ministry. We didn't suffer. When we had a transition because God was in it and I believe that with all my heart and I thank him for the blessings that we have shared together in the short time that I've been with you as your chaplain but when we surrender to the power of God within us that service that obedience it becomes a delight and not an affliction the power that works in us is the same power of the Holy Spirit of God that worked in Jesus and our English word energy actually comes from the word translated works in verse 13. It is God's divine energy that works in us and through us. The same Holy Spirit who empowered Christ when he was ministering on earth can still empower us today. The word of God is unique. It is inspired. It is authoritative. It is infallible. And if we do not appreciate the word of God, then the power of God will not energize our lives. We must also be aware of the fact that the energy of the flesh, the energy of the devil, are also at work in our midst. Because of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, God's divine energy is available to us. The power is here. But what are we going to do with it? What tools does God use to work in our lives? Well, I believe there's three tools of significant importance. These aren't the only ones, but these are significant. First is the Word of God, second is prayer, and third is obedience. The first two speak of our relationship with God. God speaks to us through His Word, we hear from Him through the Word. And then in prayer, we lift up our concerns and we foster that relationship. And then as we hear from God through His Word, through uh, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, through the voice of others that are fellow believers because we're united by the Holy Spirit, then we will obey. And we will pursue the things of God. How many of y'all heard the name of Roger Stallbach before? Great quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And he admitted that in his role as quarterback for the Cowboys, he didn't get to call any of his own plays. And that caused him great difficulty. He struggled with that because he felt like he should be able to make those calls and be able to change the plays based on what he sees. 
But Coach Landry sent in every single play. He told Roger when he could pass. He told Roger when he could run. And he only had one minor exception as to when he could change the play. And that was only an emergency situation. And he had better be right. <laughs> Even though Roger considered Coach Landry to have a genius mind when it came to football strategy and game planning, his pride said that the quarterback should be able to make his own plays and run them. And this is what he later said, and I quote him, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. What wisdom. You know, we pursue after things in our, in our flesh, and we're led by temptation. It doesn't end well for us, does it? We're miserable. But man, when we submit to obeying God, we're fulfilled. We have peace. We have joy. And that's basically what Roger was saying. He had harmony with his coach. He had harmony with his team because they were all on the same page. He had fulfillment. His role was, was helping lead the team to the ultimate goal in football, which is victory. We need to resolve to be obedient to God. Now let's look at verses 14 through 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Interesting that Jim brought that word grumbling up this morning, isn't it? We have nothing to grumble about. But he says in verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So if you want to have joy, you need to remain blameless in a crooked world. You need to remain blameless in a crooked world. Paul here is now contrasting the life of a believer with the lives of those who live in the world. Unsaved people grumble and have disputes regularly, right? But we as Christians are called to be blameless. The society in which we live in is twisted and it's distorted. It's crooked and it's perverse. But we as Christians should be on the straight path because we measure our life by God's word, which is that perfect standard. We measure it by the model that Jesus gave us because that is the perfect standard. The world is in darkness. But we as Christians are supposed to be bright, shining lights in that darkness. The world has nothing of any significance to offer us. But we as Christians, we distribute the bread of life. We are the messenger that brings the word of salvation to a world that is condemned to hell by expressing our faith in Christ and obeying him. So in other words, as we allow God to achieve his purposes in us and in our lives, we become better witnesses to a world that desperately needs to hear about Jesus. It's important for us to notice that our mission is achieved in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Paul doesn't call for us to retreat from the world in which we've been placed. He doesn't call for us to go into spiritual isolation. It's only as we are confronted with the needs and the problems of real life that we can begin to become more like Christ. So many people, when they become a Christian, want to isolate themselves. We need to be in the world, but not of it. We need to be that light that draws people unto the Lord. The Pharisees, they fell into that trap. They were so isolated and insulated from reality that they developed an artificial kind of self-righteousness that was totally unlike what God desired for them. God wanted them to be righteous as he is. Well, consequently, the Pharisees, they forced a religion of fear and bondage on the people. And they even crucified our Christ and Lord because he dared to oppose their kind of religion. We have a relationship. We have a relationship. It's so important to recognize that. But we are not called to leave the world behind. We're supposed to minister in it. And when we do that, we will see God's purpose developed within our lives. When you allow God to work in you and to do all things without grumbling or disputing, unsaved people should be expected to have those traits, right? 
But as Christians, we have changed lives. We're filled by the Spirit. So what does that mean? We have displays of the fruit of the Spirit. We should be seeing more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more faithfulness, more self-control being displayed in our lives, coming forth from who we are, and less and less of the things of the world of which we came out of. We're to have changed lives and be filled with joy. We're to do the work of God without being negative, rebellious, or disobedient. So why would Paul mention this temptation to grumble to the saints? Well, one reason is obvious. Christian perseverance is difficult, isn't it? It's an easy concept, but it's hard to actually live out. Discipleship is not easy. It's not an easy road to travel. Pursuing holiness, giving generously, practicing hospitality, loving our spouse and our kids appropriately, sharing the gospel and all the other facets of being a Christian can cause us to complain and murmur, right? It's easy to do that. The temptation to complain and argue is not only a temptation for us personally and individually, but it's also so much easier when we gather together. Because when we get an audience, what happens? Oh, yeah, let me tell you. Boy, this thing is miserable. Oh. It's easy when you got an audience. When nobody's listening, it's not as contagious. But you got to remember the context here. The Philippian church had some internal strife. They had some conflict. They also had external pressures being put on them. So under those conditions, it was easy to lead a person to complain, both about God and those that were affecting them. It's a temptation for all of us. Sometimes complaining expresses itself in whispers, and sometimes it rises to arguments. And we find examples of grumbling and arguing within the, the wilderness narratives that are written about in the Bible in Exodus and Numbers. So the question is not, will you be tempted to complain? Because you will be tempted by others. And since complaining is the common language of the culture, and it always has been, we need to know that we live in a world of complainers. So how are we going to respond? When you're tempted, what will you do? Will you downplay their sin, as often uh, is the case? Or will you remember this verse? Do not complain or argue. I think the better question is, how can we maintain a joyful attitude in the face of all these problems? Well, considering what we deserve and considering what we've been given, that should be all the reason to stop us from complaining right there in our tracks. Do you not know that we have been redeemed out of the bondage of sin and lifted up out of that miry pit and have been given new life? We have been blessed by God to spend eternity with him in glory. We will not spend eternity gnashing our teeth, begging for a drop of water to be placed on our tongue. We won't be weeping for all of eternity. We will be in glory, worshiping our Savior. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Oh, we have no reason to complain. But when we lose sight of the gospel, we'll go down into the deep, dark hole of despair. So I urge you, just as Jesus <coughs> told Peter, keep your eyes on me. Maintain faith in who I am. Keep your focus on him. And don't complain because you lost sight of God. In verse 15, obviously we should avoid grumbling because it's offensive to God and it's an awful sin. But this alone should serve as a sufficient reason to avoid it. But Paul's reason indicated uh, by that in verse 15. He's got the lost world in mind here. And this is where we come under conviction. He says that grumbling and arguing will damage our witness about who Jesus is. Do you want to answer to God in heaven? Did you know that your attitude hindered a soul from coming to me? I don't want to hear those words. I don't want to be the cause of somebody not coming to heaven because I was negative and arguing and complaining. He says grumbling will damage our witness. But if we're obedient, we may become blameless and innocent, which means we are without fault in contrast to the world around us. Our life should, should re uh, resemble 
our Heavenly Father rather than that of our neighbors who are unsaved. People should recognize us easily as God's children. We should stand out in the crowd. We're to be so distinct from unbelievers that we are known for being positive role models. And if God is working in our lives, we should be a, a contrast to what is in the world today. We should make them curious to hear what we have to say. Why are you so different? Why is it you can go through the struggles and the trials and the things that happen to us as we age? Why should you uh, uh, be able to have a smile on your face when you've gone through what you've gone through? You've lost a husband, you've lost a wife, you've lost a child. You're, you're physically just in pain every time you take a step. But you still have joy on your face because you have Christ in your heart. So if we have Christ in our heart, the world will see it no matter what our circumstances are. And it can give us that doorway to open up into the gospel conversation. Do you know Jesus? That's where my joy comes from. That's where my hope comes from. We're to shine as lights in the world. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 14, he came to be the light of the world. And if we're going to imitate him, we need to shine. If you want to shine like stars, you have to resist the temptation to grumble. And when our conversations with other believers or among outsiders are filled with negativity, we lose our distinctiveness. Paul says that we should instead be blameless, pure, and innocent in this generation. And he characterized it by, like I said, being crooked and twisted. Well, if we are falling prey to the temptation of grumbling, we lose our distinctive character. And in the words of Jesus, we have lost our saltiness. You know what salt was used for in the Old Testament, in, in the ancient world? It was a preservative. It brought life. And if salt lost its usefulness, if it no longer would season food, if it would no longer preserve food, it was thrown into the pathways and trampled upon. So don't lose your saltiness. Don't be ineffective. A man by the name of John Killinger tells a story about a manager of a minor league baseball team. And he was so disgusted with his center fielder's play that he ordered him into the dugout and the manager grabbed a glove and put on a hat and he went out in the center field himself. I'm going to show you how to play this position. Well, the first ball that was hit in the center field took a bad hop and smashed the manager right in the mouth. <laughs> The next one was a high fly ball, which he lost in the sun, and it smacked him on his forehead. The third hit was a hard line drive that flew between his hand and his glove as he tried to, to snatch it out of the air, <laughs> and it hit him right in the eye. Furious, he ran back to the dugout, and he grabbed the center fielder by his uniform, and he shook him, and he shouted at him, you idiot! You've got the field so messed up that I can't even do a thing with it. <laughs> this manager was trying to find a reason to blame anyone but himself for his failures. This is the way of the world, folks. We have to realize that people are always watching. They're always listening to what you say and they're watching how you behave. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? Are we standing out like bright stars in a dark sky? We can shine like stars. We can be that city on a hill. We can be blameless, pure, and faultless because of Christ. Consider what an opportunity we have at making an eternal difference in somebody's life just simply by speaking a different language from that of the culture going through the day, avoiding the temptation to be negative and to grumble and replacing that practice with gratitude and praise. You know, some people walk around with a scowl on their face. President of the university I went to, he said, all y'all walk around with poochy mouths. That's what he used, it was funny. Y'all didn't laugh as much as when he does. Y'all just be a poochy mouth. That's how he would say it with that Georgia accent. But you know it takes less muscle activity in our face to smile than it does to frown and walk around with a poochy mouth? 
Let us be praising God. Let us be filled with gratitude. Because the world's philosophy is to fight everybody and anything in order to get what you want. And then they'll lie to you and tell you that it'll make you happy. And when you pursue those things, you find you're only miserable. Well, the example of Jesus is proof that the world's philosophy is wrong. He never used a sword or any other weapon. Yet he won the greatest battle in history. The battle against sin and death and hell. He defeated hatred by manifesting love. He overcame lies by speaking truth. Because he surrendered, he was victorious. He yielded himself on the cross. He didn't have to do that. He did it because of his love for you and me. He willingly laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. And we sometimes forget that. He willingly laid it down, and he was victorious. So how do we live out this ongoing moral example of Jesus as children to reflect his perfection. Well, Paul here develops his argument a little further and he explains a particular way in which we should shine. He says, by holding fast to the word of life. In contrast to complaining, we as Christians should be defending and proclaiming the word of God. Don't turn loose of God's word in this dark, twisted, perverted world in which we live in. Don't stop pro proclaiming his word to a perverted culture. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Hide his word in your heart because what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. Praise God. And we can have it spill out in praise and proclamation because the word of life is our source for our vitality and it's the message that we hold out to the world. That's our purpose. That's how we glorify God. And only God's word can give us the right direction and power for him to work in our lives and keep us pure before him. Paul looks so forward to the witnessing progress that these Christians have made in their walk. They're the real reason for his ministry. They're the purpose of why he does what he does. And as he stands at the final judgment seat, I know he wants to hear the evaluation that God has for his life. And he is encouraging the Philippians to be blameless. He says, so that in the day of Christ, that I may be proud and that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So Paul moves from his exhortations to a personal reason that involves his eternal outlook on life. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. <clears throat> this image of running and <clears throat> laboring reminds us of the strenuous nature of ministry. Paul uses these images all throughout the New Testament writings. So why should we want to endure all of this difficulty? Well, Paul says he's laboring for the day of Christ. And this is instructive for us because we often minister with a very short-sighted goal, with a very short-sighted goal, but Paul is looking at the big picture. He's looking at it with an eternal perspective. He knew that the only one who mattered, the only praise that mattered was that one day Christ would evaluate his work. And because of this reality, he worked hard and he sought to finish his race well. And we read about that in 2 Timothy. But don't misunderstand the phrase here, I may be proud as a statement of personal pride or self-exaltation. That would be entirely inconsistent with the whole letter of Philippians. Paul's boasting will be boasting in the grace of God who worked in his life. He calls himself the chief sinner of all sinners. Oh, what humility he displayed. But he's saying, look at the grace of God. God has worked in my life. And because he's worked in my life, I am laboring for him. And I am investing in your life as the Philippian church. And they were fruitful. He said, I pray you're fruitful. I pray you bring glory to God. And he says, persevere in the light of this eternal perspective. Because Paul wants his life mission to end successfully. So that everything he went through will not be because it was vain. He expresses a similar thought in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, where he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Is it not you? For you are, are our glory and joy. That's why Paul did what he did. So if you want joy, then remain blameless in a crooked world. Then our final two verses. Verse 17. 
even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So if you want to have joy, we need to rejoice in our sacrifices and be glad that we can do it with other believers. Paul changes the image from running and laboring to being that of a sacrificial offering. And the previous images of being a runner and a laborer imply that he had to have endurance. But this image of being poured out implies so much more. It implies literally giving up his own life. Giving up his own life. Look at the extent of Paul's love for this church. His main focus is on their faithfulness and their, their fruitfulness. He's not complaining about serving as a drink offering. He only wants to lead them by example. And there's something impressive about this drink offering analogy that Paul says, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Wine was poured out in ancient Greek and Jewish sacrificial ceremonies. And that was the imagery that Paul was drawing on. And he's saying that I am happy to be poured out like blood for the advancement of the gospel. That's what Jesus did for me. And that's what I'm willing to do for you. I love you. I care for you. I want to be obedient to the point of even death if it's necessary. Just as Christ emptied himself, Paul is glad to pour himself out for the glory of God. He is a glad offering. If anyone had the right to complain about the circumstances of life, it's Paul. This man was beaten. He was chained. He was arrested improperly. He was held for false charges. He was uh, bitten by a snake. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned to death. But he survived it. They thought he was dead. I mean, the beatings that Paul took for the sake of the gospel was just unbelievable. And here he's, he knows that death is a potential outcome of his trial in Rome. But he wanted them to see his faith in action, and he wanted them to know that his joy was still complete in them. And his call to obedience and purity was not in vain. And that should serve as an encouragement to us to keep on keeping on as we go through this journey of life. In verse 18, Paul is encouraging them to have the same attitude and rejoice with him. He says, be glad and rejoice with me. Without doubt, he considers it a privilege to suffer for the cause of Christ. Christ was Paul's example and he's telling them to follow after Christ. We too, though, can experience joy even in difficult circumstances in our lives. But only when our primary purpose is serving God and serving others. That's what he's called us to do. He urges the church to follow his example by pouring out their lives in service and to rejoice with him. As a third century man was anticipating death, he penned these last words to a friend. This is what he wrote. It is a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and now I am one of them. End quote. Folks, God is going to reward those who have been faithful to him. The joy of the Lord is going to be a part of that reward. The faithful Christian will discover that when we suffer on this earth, that will translate into glory in heaven. Our work is not in vain. Sacrifice and service are marks of an obedient Christian. And obedience will bring joy, even in the midst of suffering. You know there's something special about all this? We don't have to wait to be in glory to receive joy here and now. It can be ours. This joy is a present reality. You know how we get it? By living a sacrifice sacrificial life of serving others and serving God. It's remarkable that when we live this way, it's remarkable that Paul 
when he lived that way, he uses words like joy and rejoice. And he repeats them over and over throughout his writings. And he was in some miserable circumstances when he was filled with joy. Most people associate sorrow and suffering with the things that he went through. But Paul sees suffering and sacrifice as doorways to a deeper joy in Christ. So we have to believe that God's promises are true and that they're going to work in our lives just as they worked in Paul's life. God works in us through the word, through prayer, and through obedience. And we work out through our daily living and service and sacrifice and obedience to others. And God fulfills his purposes when we receive the word and we believe the word and then work out what the word has worked in. And we have energy that comes from the Holy Spirit. And the results will bring us joy. So Paul gives the church and us an amazing picture of how to rejoice through difficult times. So how can we rejoice? How did he rejoice? Because he understood and knew that Jesus was Lord. Will you say it with me? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Through Jesus, we have far more blessings than we deserve. And that alone should be enough to cause you to worship God for who he is. So how do we live in light of the truths of Christ's example? In the shadow of the cross and before the throne of God, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are to be a shining light in a dark world. We are not to grumble, but we're to hold out the word of life, and we are to rejoice through our sacrificial service rooted in the grace of God, anticipating that coming day of Christ. Rejoice in your sacrifices and be glad. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had in your word. We praise you for the encouragement that it brings us. But Lord, your word also is giving us a deep challenge. We are to live this life separated, to stand out, in the midst of the darkness in which we are placed. We're to be the bright, shining light, like a star in a dark sky. Lord, let us be found faithful to being filled with love and peace and joy. Let us be patient in all things. Let us be quick to forgive, quick to listen and slow to speak. Fill us with wisdom and understanding. Lord, as I pray every day, I pray for those divine disruptions that you bring to each of us and that we will see them for what they are and that we'll have opportunity to, to be an encouragement to other Christians as well as to those that don't know you. To give us that opening and that doorway to bring the bread of life to them. Lord, it's only by your power and through your Holy Spirit that we are able to accomplish any of this. So let us always keep that relationship healthy. Let us be in your word daily. Let us read it. Let us study it. Let us meditate on it. And Lord, let us hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. Lord, I pray as we move into this week that you'll give us the ability to overcome the temptation to grumble and complain. And that we will just be filled with joy and praise and lift you up high and mighty as you deserve to be lifted up. For your glory and your honor, always in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, number 172, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We're going to sing all three verses, and if you would please rise on the third verse.
this. I created a YouTube page so that we can get online and watch the Bible study and the services on Sunday morning. But I need a favor. I need you to go to YouTube, type in that address that's there, youtube.com at Chaplain Jim Stickle. And if you will subscribe to that page, we get 50 subscribers, we can live broadcast our service so that everyone can have access Amen. to it until we get the other device up and running. So if you'll do that, we can make it happen together, okay? Yeah.